Glory, glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. So, Pastor Dave ministered on Sunday about Alpha and Omega, an end and a beginning. You know, and it's interesting that we say Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. And, you know, way too many times we need an ending and a beginning more than we need a beginning and an ending. And so I want you to just meditate tonight, army, that you've called them to be. I thank you, Father God, that the, that the little ones shall lead us. We thank you, Father God, they're dedicated. Thank you, Father God, they are dedicated to the things that you've called them to. And we thank you for blessing them. Bless them, Father. Bless them. Open doors so that they always see your glory. And I thank you, Father God, that even as their teenage years, they'll continue to see the work of angels in their life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Well, youth, go ahead. Go get it. Go on. Have a good time. Leave us here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Well, we are going to do not by accident. You know, none of us want to see an accident. You drive by and there's an accident there and you're like, oh, no, look, there's an accident. You have all kinds of rubberneckers. You got pe people walking by, driving by, just grabbing attention. You know, and God really doesn't do things by accident. God has not commanded us in his scripture for the things that we're to do and what things we're to learn. None of it is by accident. All of it's by great plan by God. God has a plan. Whether we can see his plan or not, he has a plan. Not by accident. In an accident, there's destruction. And so I want us to focus on tonight the fact that God is doing some things in our life that is not by accident, but is, it is by a greater plan. All right, John. So we're going to start in Acts 11.23. Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad. How many of you have seen the grace of God in your life? Amen. Okay, then be glad. Be exceedingly glad. God has given you grace. God has graced us. He has graced us. He's given us grace. Was, ex was glad and exhorted them all. And so I'm going to exhort you tonight on this topic that we're going to take a look at. I'm going to encourage you. And one thing I like, and Pastor Dave also said this weekend, don't despise small beginnings. So the good thing about small beginnings is, is I can look at each one of you in the eye and, and we can nod at each other and we can, you, you can let me know you understand what God's doing and, I, and I'll let you know that I know that God's doing something in your life. And so exhorted them that with purpose of heart this evening we're going to look at purpose of heart for the topic we're going to look at purpose of heart on purpose we are going to do a few things purpose of heart now if you take a look their cars have interacted and they're standing there and they're not fighting at this point I use that picture because even though they've had an accident they're they're trying to make a plan they're on, they're on their cell phone. They're, they're, you know, looking for the right people to show up, you know. So it doesn't matter whether you've had an accident in the spirit or not. Well, there's a plan. And so if you've had an accident, we're just going to go forward. Purpose of heart, they would cleave unto the Lord. And so when we have nothing else to do, we cleave. Amen. We hold on. We cleave unto the Lord. When nothing else is going on, hold on. Next slide, John. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. If you don't love God, things aren't going to work together for you. Things aren't going to work out. If you don't love God, things are just going to go downhill. Things are going to stop. Accidents are going to happen all around you, and they're not going to work out for good. Now, Lisa has a good testimony. She had a deer run out in front of her, and it was not a good thing, but God's working it out. It's all working out. It's not what she wanted, but it's all working out. And if we'll allow God, even when there's an accident in our life, it'll all work out. God will put the right people at the right place with the right information. Good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose, not your own purpose. You see, we can be called according to our purpose, and 
end, it's not going to be very fruitful. But if we're called according to his purpose, we're going to produce fruit. Well, I don't know. I don't know, Karen, what my real call is. Well, it's high time you do. If you don't know what you're called to, I would get alone. I would be my business to take some time, uh, uh, shut myself away from the rest of the family or the rest of the world and figure out what my purpose is. Because you can't purpose in your heart to do the right thing if you don't know what your purpose is. And so until you can purpose in your heart, you got to figure, or you can only purpose in your heart once you figure that out. Verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, God already knew. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. So God's will for you, there's a purpose, is to be conformed to his son. You're not to look like yourself. You're not to look like me. You're not to look like Pastor Jim. You're to look like Jesus. That's what you're called to do. That's one of the callings that we all have. Every single one of us sitting in the room tonight have the same calling to be destined to be conformed to the image of Jesus. To be conformed to the image of Jesus. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And in Colossians 1.10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord. Walk worthy of the Lord. That means we can walk. We can walk in the things of Jesus and still not be fulfilling the plan of God for our life. And yet you can still have an accident and, and be in the plan, the will of God. Because just because you've had an accident, just because you've had a, uh, uh, something that has held you up or something that's come against you or attacked you does not necessarily mean that you're out of the will of God. See, so often we think, well, you know, the devil got me. I must be out of the will of God. No, not necessarily. The devil attacks you because he doesn't like you. Now, could you be out of the will of God? Yeah, you could, but only you know that. The rest of us probably don't know that. We might have a clue if it's something directly contrary to what the Word of God says, but pretty much only you know whether you're out of the will of God or not. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, you do. We do know. We do know when we're out of the will of God. That you might worthy of, of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in some of your things. No. Nope. It doesn't say that. It says being fruitful in every good work. Being fruitful in everything that we do, in every good work. At, well, this work that I'm doing, it's not really a good work. Then what are you doing it for? You see, if you're not sure that what you're doing is of God, what are you doing it for? We, we, and only we can answer that. We have to ask ourselves, is this what I should be doing? And increasing in the knowledge of God. If you are not increasing in the knowledge of God every week, I won't say every day. I mean, you know, every day is a pretty burdensome thing, but although it probably should be every day, we should learn something about God and his word every day, but at least every week. And, and we need to put this on our checklist. Did I learn anything about the Bible or God this week? I did. I learned a few things on Sunday from Pastor Dave I didn't know before. I thought they were pretty good. They were exciting to me. Ready, John? John 13:34 says this. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Take a look at that accident. There are a couple vehicles involved, and they are scattered. In other words, they're, they're all not the same direction. You know, sometimes we think when we've had a headbutting with a person that they must be wrong because they're going in a different direction than we are. Not necessarily. Sometimes we headbutt people, and we're both going in the wrong direction, which has really caused the accident doesn't mean that just they were going in the wrong direction. It just might mean that they got off track or I got off track. Think about two trains passing each other and they, they have an accident. They were on their own track. They were going the right direction. But when they got off track, that's when the accident happened. And so we have a new commandment. 
that Jesus gave us, and that was to love one another as he has loved us, as he has loved us. I am fully convinced that the reason people doubt the love of God in their life is because they have not made the decision to love other people the way Jesus loves those people. And if they don't love other people, then they're pretty sure that God doesn't love them, which makes it snowball or domino even worse. I don't love other people because God doesn't love me. So it all comes back to the original commandment that we are to love others because God loved us first. And accepting the love of God for ourselves so that we can love others. Verse 35 says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. We, we get it so mixed around, you know, they'll know I'm a disciple of God if I lay hands on people and they get healed. They'll know I'm a disciple if I speak in tongues or if I can prophesy, you know. Those things are nice things, but they do not determine whether we are a disciple of Jesus. Only love determines whether we're a disciple of Jesus. And this is such a basic topic and something that we are so good at in our church. And like Pastor Dave was saying Sunday night, I know I'm ministering to the choir. When I look at your faces, you are people that are full of love. But how much more can we increase that love and really be the leaders in love? I want to grow in love. I mean, I, I, I can say truly, I, I love everyone that's here. I love the people that are here. But how much better would it be if I grew in that love? Because honestly, I know God loves you more than I do. I know that. Okay, I know I'm not going to catch up to his love. However, if he loves you more than I do, then I can grow in it. Then I'm not complete yet. And if I ever say, well, that's it, I love y'all, I'm good, then I'm not growing in Christ. And, and, you know, I know there's nothing Mike and Keisha wouldn't do for me if I asked you. I know that. You know I would do for you. But yet I really should make it my business to continue to enforce that in you, to encourage you. We, we started out saying I'm going to encourage you in this lesson so our business is to encourage people in the fact that not only does God love them with an unconditional love but we love them with an unconditional love next slide John John 15 9 says as the father has loved me so have I loved you continue in my love well that's the track we're supposed to be on and if you get off that track in any way, shape, or form, you're going to have a jackknifing of your train. You know, you still might have been heading in the right direction, but if you get off track, there's an accident. And just as trains, as they get off the track, cause a lot of damage, me getting off track of the love of God can cause a lot of damage to other people. And I need to accept the fact that I need to be responsible, that if, if in any way I am offensive, I need to make it my business to make it right. I'm not, I'm not bad at saying I'm sorry. I just need to get better at it. I somewhat accept responsibility, but I know I need to get better at it. You know, someone was saying to me, oh, this was maybe a month or so ago, something had happened, and they, they said, uh, oh, I forgive you. That was great, right? Except I'm thinking, you forgive me, what I do? <laughs> you know, and uh, it almost became offensive to me. Like, what do you mean you forgive me? You know, and they were being good. They were being good, and I'm like, well, what'd I do? Well, sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Marion's like, well, yeah, <laughs> what'd I do? <laughs> but you see, I need to stay on that track. So what if someone else thinks you did something wrong? <laughs> so what? Really, is it a problem? You know, give them a chance to walk out their love then. They need that chance to walk out their love, okay. 
Verse 10 says, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. So I'm telling myself on a daily basis, I need to figure out what God has called me to do that day. Because those are truly his commandments for me. You see, the commandments for me are not the same as for you, other than the two that Jesus said are our main commandment. That's to love God with our full heart, mind, soul, body, strength, and everything. And then to love others as ourselves. Those are the two major commandments. But there's a whole bunch of commandments in my life, things God told me to do. And you see, I can't go about loving people till I'm obedient to God. Because verse 10 says, keep my commandments and you'll stay in my love. It's a whole easier, it it seems like they really don't have a lot to do with each other, but they do. The more I stay in his commandments, the easier it is to love other people. And why is that? Because I'm so busy with me, I I could care less what someone else is doing. Because I'm too busy trying to fulfill what God's called me to do. I heard Gloria Copeland say something really good. Pastor Jim drew my attention to it. She was talking about depression. And she said, the way to deal with depression is take your eyes off yourself. Quit being so selfish. Quit worrying about yourself. You won't be depressed if you're worried about taking care of others and loving others and caring for others and ministering to their needs. You don't have time to be depressed. (laughs) Yeah. I'm too busy. These last couple of weeks, I've been too busy to worry about me. And isn't that amazing? I had no problems. I had no problems because I was too busy to worry about me. You shall abide in my love even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Next slide, please. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 says, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Now, I picked a train, a little Tommy the Train picture to put up there, because that's elementary. (laughs) That's very simplified. Well, this is very simplified. If I put the biggest concentration of my effort into that first commandment, which is right there, verse 37, loving the Lord my God, with all my heart, and with all my soul, which is all my feelings, to love God with all my feelings. Well, I don't feel like it. What well, doesn't matter? I need to. Well, I don't feel like going out and doing whatever it is. That's so what? If you love God, you're obedient to his commandments. If he tells you to get up and take care of someone else at whatever time it is, then you do it because your soul, loving him with all your soul, says I'm going to be obedient no matter how I feel about it. I'm just going to do it because God says so. And with all my mind. Shut up, mind. This is what God said to do. And that is the first and the great commandment. That's first. That's first. Until we love God with everything that's in us, we can't love other people. Until we love God, we we can't fulfill the call on our life. Until we love God with everything that's in us, we... We'll never be satisfying to ourselves or to anybody else. And so we have to fulfill the first call, the first commandment. And then verse 39 says, and the second is like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. You see, we we live our life, I think, sometimes we're trying to love our neighbor. And boy, there's stinkers sometimes, you know, and we're trying to love our neighbor and we're trying to do a good job. and, And, you know, we're putting this effort into a love in our neighbor, whereas if we just love God first, Loving our neighbor wouldn't be so hard. You see, it's hard to love people. It's easy to love God. And so we put our effort into loving God. And loving God says, whatever he says, that's what I'm going to do. There is no buts. There is no but I thinks. There is no, yeah, but if we did it this way, there is none of that. If I love God, that's... That's it. 
And then verse 40 says, on those two hang all the law and the prophets. And the law and the prophets are really a good way to guide your life. Like it's great to have a prophetic word, but you're not going to get a prophetic word that means diddly squat if you're not worried about the first two commandments. See, and so many people are like, ah, if I just got a word about this, it'd be so much easier. You know, if I just knew I was on the right track and God says, why don't you just love me first and you'll know you're on the right track. Just love me. Put your effort after me and you'll know you're on the right track and you'll stop having accidents because you'll stay on the right track. I love God. That's it. I love God. Next slide, John. So 1 John 4, 16 says, and we have known and believed the love that God has to us, towards us, hath to us. God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. And so sometimes we feel like we get ourselves way out on the, on the limb. <laughs> you know, we're way out there. We don't have any support. You know, which is like, God, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what's going to happen next. I don't know how any of this is going to happen. I don't know what is going to be the next step. And God's like, it's all right. I'm love. You love me because I am love. That's all you need. That's all you need to know. You know, we say when two young people fall in love and there is no such thing as falling in love by the way you <laughs> fall into a ditch you develop love love is a fruit it develops you don't fall into love you develop love but when we have two young people and they're they're in love and we say they think they can live on love well god says you can as long as he's the lover not trusting in other people or worldly things, but trusting in the love of God, that the love of God is the answer and it's enough. The love of God will handle everything. The Bible promises us that because as we know, if you read just the last line, love never fails. True love never fails. It won't fail because love is God. God is love. God doesn't fail. Love doesn't fail. Proverbs 3, 5 says, this trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Whoa, that sounds like love the Lord with all thine heart. You see, if you love the Lord with all your heart, you trust in the Lord with all your heart. If you love, you trust and it, there's how to know whether you love God or not. Do you trust God? If you don't trust God, you don't love him. That's tough, Karen. Why are you being so tough, Pastor Karen? Because it's the truth. If you question whether God is going to take care of you, you don't know love. You would never not take care of someone you loved if it was in your power to do so. So either you serve a weak God or you don't know God. Because God is love, God is enough, and he will take care of you. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to your own understanding. You see, trust the issue with trust is people want to solve it in their own mind. We don't trust God because it doesn't make sense to us how God's going to do this or how, how it's going to be done or where's the money going to come from or, or, you know, how can God have that person do it when they've said, no, 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 no. I can't tell you how many times I've heard someone say, no, 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 no. And then it's like they say yes and you're like, where did that come from? Because God can change someone's heart suddenly. It happens, huh, honey? Yes. <laughs> I can give you story after story of myself or Pastor Jim. I can tell on me, too, besides telling on him. I'd say, no, 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 no. And then all of a sudden, it's like, well, yeah. And you're like, wait, where'd that come from? How'd that come out of my mouth? Who said that? 
and you know it was God changing your heart. And when you trust God with all your heart, he will change your heart if you're wrong. He will. Trust him to. Trust him to tell you what to do. I go to God and say, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what the answer is supposed to be. And I let it go. I quit trying to solve it with my brain. I'm a pretty smart person. I am. I've been gifted. Pastor Dave also taught this weekend on using your gifts. You know, sometimes Pastor Jim's mad at me because I want to do this and I want to do that and I want to do the other. And, I, I, you know, I, I say to him, but God, God's gifted me in that. I need to use my gift. I can't bury my gift. I've got to use my gift. And so we need to use those gifts. And so I have a very good mind. My IQ is two points from a genius level. But I can't solve stuff that only God can solve. I have to, on purpose, the purpose of my heart, let it go and say, God, I don't get it. I don't know how that's going to be fixed, but I trust you. I trust you, God, that it's going to be fixed. I trust you more than I trust me. And you see, I know me more than you know me. And I know I am not that good. I am not that great without Jesus. With Jesus, I'm everything. With Jesus, without Jesus. With Jesus, oh, without Jesus. And with Jesus, we can do all things. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. That's why I can't do all things. So, for, uh, excuse me, the Isaiah 26, 3 says, Thou, God, will keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed not on the problem whose mind isn't trying to solve it but whose mind is stayed on God because I trust in God and so we have to practice and on purpose if you are not turning something over to God right now then you probably haven't taken on enough prayer you know if you have not this week on purpose had to turn something over to God, then you're not taking on enough prayer and then releasing it. Take it on, but don't keep it. Take it on as a prayer challenge and give it to God and trust him. And next week, take on another prayer challenge and give it to God. You see, if you take it on, you're keeping it, then you're trying to solve it, then you're not trusting God. That's why a lot of times people will say, you remember what we prayed for last week? And I'll say, no. And they look at me like, you're so rude. You don't remember stuff. No, I so trust God that once I give it to God, I've given it to God and I don't remember it anymore. On purpose, I've practiced that. On purpose, when I pray over something, I truly Give it up to God. That's how I know when I am not trusting God. When it keeps coming back up in my brain, I haven't given it up. I still have it. I'm still trying to solve it. I'm still worried about what, what's God going to do? How's he going to uh, perform this? Who's he going to work on? You know, what's going to happen next? If that's going through my mind, I am not trusting God. And so when, my, when that comes up in my brain, I say, no brain, shut up. I've given it to God. I'm not going to think about it. No, I refuse to think about that. I've given it to God. No, devil, don't put that thought in my brain. I have control over the thoughts I think. Devil, you do not have control over the thoughts I think. I have control over the thoughts I think. The Bible says that I am to take into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. When people say, well, I just couldn't help it. I was just thinking about it. No, you just wouldn't stop. You chose not to stop. Well, I can't make myself stop. Yes, you can. Or the Bible would have said, taking into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, except for uh, you, Susie. I can use Susie because she's not here. Except for you, Susie, because we know you can't control your brain. 
But since the Bible didn't give any of us an exemption, that means we all have the authority to stop thinking about thoughts of the world and to think on the things of Jesus. We all have that on purpose, purpose in my heart. This is what I'm going to do on purpose. I'm going to trust God. Next slide, John. 1 John 4, 17 says, herein is our love made perfect. This is how we take our love and make it perfect, that we may have boldness in the day when Satan comes against us, because as Jesus is, so are we in this world. You see, when I have my love perfect, how is my love perfect? When I am focused on the Lord, when I say, I am going to walk in the love of God, my love is perfect because he is perfect, not because I'm perfect. Therefore, when the devil comes, comes against me the day of judgment I say devil as Jesus is so am I how'd you make God attacking Jesus with that did that go pretty good devil let me know how that went and you know it didn't go very good the devil didn't take Jesus over so he's not going to take me over because I have Jesus living in me and so do you you have Jesus living in you why are you so afraid the devil's going to win you don't trust that you have Jesus in you. Oh, you're being tough again. Yeah, I am. When you fear the devil's going to win in your cir circumstance, it's because you don't trust that Jesus lives in you. When you're a little kid and you're a six foot five, Daddy is standing behind you. Well, Pastor Jim's not 6'5", but to me, he might as well be 6'5". As a little kid, with all he knew and can do, if he's standing behind that little kid, that little kid would have all the confidence in the world that his daddy was going to take care of it. That little kid, I mean, you hear Jesse tell these stories about him just getting that other kid's face because he knew his daddy was standing behind him. You see, I know my daddy, God, is standing behind me. And I know I'm not perfect, but I know my daddy's going to love me. And my daddy may whip my hiney if I get out of line, but he's going to defend me. Whether I'm right or wrong, he's going to defend me because I'm his child. And he's going to defend you, right or wrong, because you're his child. He's not going to turn his back on you. He loves you. And his love is perfect. Okay, so, 1 John 2, 5. But whosoever keepeth his word, oh, see, there's where we lose confidence. If I'm not keeping the word of God, I don't have confidence to stand up and go, Daddy, defend me, because I'm not keeping the word. I'm not keeping the commandment. What commandment? I thought we only had two. Well, if I'm not doing God's word, I'm not loving him with my whole heart, my whole mind, and my whole soul. But whosoever keepeth his word in him truly is the love of God perfected. That's how I have perfect love. Verse, uh, 1 John 4, 17. That perfect love is told us about in 1 John 2, 5. I have perf God's perfect love. When I keep his word, hereby know that we are in him. 1 John 4, 12 says, No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. When God dwells in us, his love is perfected in us. So we have to stop saying, just because I had an accident, I don't have the love of God in me. That's not true. You do have the love of God in you, whether you've had an accident or not. Think about it. Those cars were in accidents, but that didn't change what kind of car they were. You know, can you imagine driving a Mercedes-Benz and you have an accident and it's like, whoa, it changed into a Ford. It didn't change what it was just because it was in an accident. You are the child of God. You are full of the love of God. And even if you have an accident, it doesn't change who you are. You still have Jesus residing in you. You are the love of God because you have God living in you. Next slide. next slide there we go first john 4 18 says there is no fear in love if you're afraid things aren't going to work out you are not grown up in the love of god that's a way to recognize whether you're not grown up in god if you have fear if you have fear you need to pump in more love 
How do you do that? With the word, meditating on the word, confessing the word, believing the word, and making the decision to trust God. But perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother to whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he's not seen? Check yourself out. This should be the biggest blinking red light. You know, it should be sirens and everything else. If you hear yourself say, I hate that when they, I, I just really don't like them when they, if that, if that goes through your mind or you even say it out of your mouth, you should be like, eh, 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 uh-oh. You can't say you love God if you hate somebody. I'm really stepping on some toes. Probably not you that are sitting here, but everybody that's sitting here knows someone that they've heard within the last month say, I hate that person. And I mean a churchgoer. Because I hear a bunch of stuff people think I don't hear. And I really want to say to them, you love God? The scripture says, how can you love God if you say you hate that person? Well, they're not my brother. Really? You're that judge? You're that good that you're willing to be that judge. I'm not willing to judge somebody. If someone says, has, tells me they're born again or they're attending a ch church, I am willing. Now, I can hate what someone's doing, but I cannot hate them. You've got to separate you from your actions. And your actions, you might have an accident, but you are not that action. That's why you can separate other people from their actions. Just because they made a mistake, had an accident, doesn't make them not a Mercedes Benz any longer. Okay? All right, so in verse 21, in this commandment have we from him that he who loveth God loves his brother also. Romans 12, 9, let love be without dissimul dissimulation, which means hypocrisy. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't people, tell people you love them and then have hate in your heart. Abhor that which is evil but cleave to that which is good. We said we're to cleave to God. We have to cleave to what's good. Stay holding on to what's good. Be kindly, affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. John? 1 John 5, 1, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begotteth loveth him also that is begotten of him. 1 Peter 1, 22, seeing you have purified your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, in obeying the commandments or the truth through the Spirit to fervent, unfeigned love or love that is of God, See that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently or passionately. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Go on to the next slide. I'm going to finish up. 1 John 5, 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Now, John 13, 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That you love one another. Here's the bottom line for how we stay on track. You want to act in a certain way to somebody. Would God do it? When you ask yourself, should I blah, 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 would God do that? Yes, God would do that. All right, then let's ask one better. Do you want God to do that to you? The bottom line is, if you want God to do it to you, then it's probably a good thing to do to someone else. If you don't want God to do it to you, then it is really most probable that it's not the right thing to do to somebody else. Next slide. 
15, 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, that, and I have ordained you. God has ordained each and every one of us to bring forth fruit, and the fruit remains. Why? So that whatever we ask of the Father in his name, he may give it to us. You see, we all want to get there. And in the church, a lot of times we preach, you know, uh, make, your, make your confessions, make your declarations, uh, ask whatever you will of the Father, and he'll do it unto you. But you see, the caveat is, are you walking in love? Have you set yourself up to be for the love of God so that you can love others first? And then whatever you're asking God for is going to happen. So let's go to the next slide. I'm going to skip that right now. 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. If you love God, you'll want to do everything he asks you to do. If you don't want to do what God's asking you to do, either you're missing God or you, you just haven't developed that love for God yet. Because when God asks you to do it, even if it's something you'd rather not do, you do it because you love them. There are things that Pastor Jim asked me to do, quite honestly, I don't want to do them. But I get up and I do them because I love him. And there are many things that he does for me, not because he wants to do them, but because he loves me. And that's how we are with the Father. If we love God, if we say we love God, we will do whatever it is God asks us to do. Amen? And you can put the last slide up then, John, the very last one. John 17, 26, And I have declared unto them thy name, and I will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be with them and I in them, not by accident. We'll be passing will be trains on our mission going our direction not having an accident with people because we'll be staying on track the love track if we stay on the love track we're not going to have an accident amen amen glory to god pastor jim you have anything you want to add no pastor mel pastor ray anyone else Anyone have anything they'd like to add or ask or do? Spoke, spoke a lot of that for Sunday morning. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Okay, well, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up to you our lies and ask you, Father, to show us how to love people more. I know, Father God, that we are doing a good job in this church with something we're known for, and Father God, we want to produce more fruit. It says in your word in John, the 15th chapter, that every branch that bears, you purge so that we might bring forth more fruit. So, Father God, I look at it, this as a little trimming, just trimming the excess, trimming the waste away, Father God, so that we can build up greater in love, so that we can be your ambassador for love into the world, drawing people into you, Father God, because you're who, you're the bottom line, you're who matters. So, Father, thank us, uh, thank you that we are able to do this to give you glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.